Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is a brown belt under Kai Otera. He's a certified strength and conditioning specialist, and he's also a functional range conditioning mobility specialist. He's a certified functional strength coach, and he's the owner of Victory High Performance, a great athletic uh, strength and conditioning facility for jiu-jitsu athletes in San Jose, California. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be joined today by Matt Guffey. How are you today, Matt? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great, man. I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Matt, uh, the topic of strength and conditioning is a an interesting one in jiu-jitsu. I think that culturally, jiu-jitsu has this vibe of you don't need strength and athleticism. Everything should be techni- technique-based. But for the people that compete and the people that do add strength training to their regimens, they're like, why was I not doing this from day one? So I'm hoping that you can help us today uh, put some maybe some myths or some misconceptions to rest and educate us a little bit more on how we can be more um, armored from injury how we can have better mobility and how we can increase our longevity in the sport by using mobility and strength training. So I appreciate you taking the time to be here today, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course. So Matt, the question I always like to start with, tell us about where you're from originally and what your life was like before you got into jujitsu. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, Originally from, we'll say I grew up in North Carolina and Virginia and I moved out here to California. Now, eight and a half years ago, almost nine years ago, maybe. And, uh, before jujitsu, I coached ice hockey. Uh, I played grown up. Yeah. I, I played grown up and I played in the Boston area. I played in, uh, for Worcester state university briefly, and then, um, ended up finishing school in Vermont. And, uh, I was gonna teach French at a private school and coach hockey and do the whole thing. And then I was like, man, I just, I don't want to be in a classroom. I'd rather coach. And I found my way out to California. I I was visiting a friend at the time. I fell in love with it. I was staying in the mission in San Francisco. I was like, I can't believe people live like this. It's so different than the East coast. And so I, I reached out to the sharks youth organization and I was like, Hey, looking to coach. And they asked if I was moving there. I was like, well, I can, if you need me to, like, I I don't have any plans. I'll, I'll do whatever. And they invited me out. I interviewed, they hired me. And then six months later, I was out here in San Jose. So I started coaching for the Sharks uh, amateur hockey division. I coached their top 16 and 18 year olds for the better part of four years. Wow. And then uh, in the middle of all that, I, you know, I wasn't playing hockey anymore and I was looking for an outlet. I was looking for, I missed that team aspect. I missed the the physical challenge, you know, like you can play adult league, but it's not the same as it was playing like competitive hockey. Um, I had some prior experience with, with jujitsu very, very briefly in Virginia, actually. So when I was, um, I was probably 18 or 19 years old and a friend of mine, uh, had mentioned going to gold medal grappling, which is run by Elijah Harshbarger and the pro there was Chris McCray, who was in the ultimate fighter. And, um, he was, you know, as far as Virginia goes, he, I mean, he's legit, you know, yeah, he, yeah, he, totally. he, slouch. I mean, he made the UFC. So, uh, so he was one of the coaches there. So I had some, I had a brief brush with jujitsu at the time, but nothing as technical as I'm doing right now. That's no knock on, Elijah or Chris or anything, their, their goals, MMA, you know, now, and now I'm like full-time jujitsu. So when I came out here and I started thinking, you know, I was looking for a different challenge. I was looking for something to push myself through. And I started to look up jujitsu academies. I noticed there's a lot of names attached to these places. I start to look up the names. Coyote is right down the street. I'm like, you guys won 12 world championships. That'd be crazy not to go here. And, and he, you know, this is, it's his academy, it's HQ. So it's his academy. He's there, he coaches. Um, and so I just stumbled upon it and I've been going every day ever since. And that's, that was seven and a half years ago now. That's incredible. That's so it's cool, man. It, well, talk about a stroke of luck. Yeah, that you end up uh, yeah. up the street from Coyotera of all people. Yeah, I yeah. got I got a, a good buddy of mine who lives in Atlanta who's actually moving out to uh, to work with Tesla of all things. And, okay. Uh, he he he's found himself. He, he's probably going to be living pretty close to the academy. So I'll introduce you guys after Sweet. the interview. Yeah, he's, please he's looking, do. Yeah, he's looking for a new home. I said, I mean, dude, if you're going to be right there and Coyotera's right there, you'd be a fool not to train there. So yeah, that's it's uh, a blast. that's really cool. You know, something you mentioned there that I always find interesting is that a lot of people that are in involved in athletics and sports, uh, especially like youth and, um, 
in college sports and high school sports and things like that is a lot of times that 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 trajectory ends completely once school's over like they just find themselves like you said there's adult leagues and stuff but it's not always quite as structured and it's not quite the same thing um and, and jujitsu is just such an excellent transition for a lot of people to make and anytime i have, have a friend or something that maybe played football or basketball and they're just struggling to stay in shape or stay athletic after school i always say man come on do jujitsu man like this, this is yeah. something you can do forever so that's uh that's really cool that you transition from hockey over over to uh to jujitsu man that's that's really yeah cool. i i think joe rogan's mentioned it before he's like you you know you can't do jujitsu without going 100 percent. yeah you can like lightly roll but you gotta have to try yeah yeah and that's something that really that was attractive to me it's something you have to try you 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 have to try to do even late into your you know late into your jujitsu career so to speak um, so it's not something you can just like phone it in. You kind of have to, you got to work and that's what I wanted. So hundred percent. Well, it's also, it, it's also one of the few combat sports, uh, sorry, hang on one second. It's one of the few combat sports uh, that I can even think of where you can go a hundred percent. And most of the time you end up not concussed, uh, no yeah. injuries most of the time. Of course we get hurt here and there, but it's one of those sports where, man, it's, it's relatively safe to go a hundred percent when you're training hard yeah. with your friends and stuff. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. You, you couldn't do that in football, right? No, like if no. You were going Boxing. Full like speed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You, you couldn't. <laughs> do it so that's yeah. that's what's attractive about it to me that's awesome now now how did your how did your uh, path in strength and conditioning begin when when did that begin uh, when did that become something that was really uh important to you when did that passion that start? started when i was probably 13 or 14 years old so i started playing hockey when i was young i, I should i should say not young younger than i am now but i started playing hockey when i uh i started playing hockey late compared to my teammates so most kids who make it to college hockey, at least start when they're four or five, you know, really, really little. Sure. And I didn't start till I was 12. So that's eight years behind. That's eight years that I had to, I had to catch up. And I knew that I would have to work extra hard if I wanted to make it the level I wanted to make it. Yeah. And I saw some other players in the area, guys who are more skilled than me guys who've been playing for a lot longer were working with a strength coach there locally and i was like uh, she's hired like I, if i want to be where they're at that seems like the right place to go to start and so i started working with her ruth ennis was her name and she did a great job she just she was so caring and understood where i was coming from and coached to my level and got me to do things that i you know i wouldn't have otherwise been able to do and that was really cool so that's kind of where that's where it started and then all throughout my career, I had, I was really fortunate to have really great strength and conditioning coaches. And I knew deep down, I was like, you know, if I didn't play hockey professionally and I didn't coach hockey professionally, that's something that I could totally do. They're always in the gym. They have a blast. You know, they're always, the strength coaches is, is uh, how do I put this? Like if something goes wrong on the team, the, the head coach gets the blame. Yeah. The strength coach doesn't typically get the blame. The strength coach is like everybody's buddy. <laughs> right. I'm like, man, I could be everybody's buddy. Like, that's cool. Um, and so, you know, I, I was always really close with my, with those strength coaches, even up through, through college. And I think they appreciated the, the hard work that I put in and the work ethic that I brought to the, to the weight room. And that's something that I, I always um, knew that I, that was something that I did better than most people. And so when I, um, well, when I was coaching hockey, I coached for, I coached teams and I coached privately. I did like private skills, coaching, skating, shooting, um, all the things that would go into making a, a really good skilled player. And then COVID happened. And once COVID happened, everything shut down, the rink shut down. I was, I found myself giving hockey lessons on zoom which i never thought in a million years i'd be wow. doing that was that was a an experience in and of itself because yeah. i had to become extremely precise with the language i used I, I at the time i hated it but i was i'm happy that it happened because it made me a way better coach wow. there's only so much you can do with one kid a puck a net and your voice because you can't be there to move them around or put them in the right position you have to be really really accurate with what what it is you're saying sure and so i started doing that and i was like man like i gotta i've got to make these sessions valuable and i want them to get the most out of the 30 minutes or 45 minutes however long it is and so i started throwing in some of the strength stuff that I had been recommending before, but didn't have any control over, right? I'd be, I'd work with them on the ice and be like, all right, this is how you could get stronger here. 
do this, 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 and this. And, you know, over time, these things will get easier. Now I'm in their living room, right? Because we're on Zoom. And so I'm like, all right, we're going to do this now. And we're going to do this the way that I, you know, that I've been recommending. And sure enough, after like three or four months, people are like, man, I used to not be able to do X, but now I can. And that's really cool. And I'm like, yeah, it works. You got stronger. It's really cool. And so I, that really was what did it for me. That was the, the moment where I was like, I could do this. I could do this like full time. And so I got one of my former players to agree to let me help him. He was preparing to go to college and I programmed for him remotely. And then he brought somebody else. And then we opened in a small studio space. It was maybe, I don't know, 1200 square feet, maybe a little bit less. And we shared with other trainers, but was really just one-on-one -on -one training kept it really low profile. Everybody kept their distance. We did the whole COVID thing. And then, uh, two people turned into four, four turned into 10. Next thing you know, I needed my own place. We got our own, um, we had a warehouse spot that was 600 square feet and we worked out of there for a while. And then now we're in a 2,400 square foot standalone spot in downtown San Jose. We're right around the oh, corner from, from Coyotera. And man. it's, uh, yeah, it's been a wild ride. If I could back up just one moment and that is, the transition from hockey to jujitsu, as far as like coaching people goes, uh, I figured out really quickly that my business wasn't going to survive if I stuck to only hockey players because they come back for four months and then they leave for eight. Yeah. Yep. And I, and we got to the end of the summer and I was like, Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Like this is <laughs> this. Is, and so I thought I was like, well, who do I like spending most of my time with? I train all the time. Like that's, those are the people that I think I could help. You know, I see them all the time injured, uh, there's always something going on. There's always something, you know, somebody is going through something. And if I could help that population, uh, that would just, that would, I'd be thrilled, right? Like that would be, uh, that'd be really cool. So we made the full transition to um, coaching jujitsu athletes. We still have some hockey players who come back over the summer, but I'd say 90% of our clientele are jujitsu athletes and, um, yeah, it's been a it's been an absolute blast. That's so that's the story behind the gym and how we got to to coaching uh, jujitsu athletes. That's incredible, well, dude! Congratulations on all your success, man. That really is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I love I love seeing Thanks. people p chase a passion and make it and build something awesome. So that's really cool. Um, you know, that kind of brings us to the to the idea of strength training for jujitsu. And this is it's kind of an interesting topic, Matt, because I, I think that there's there's a there's a long-standing mantra that's existed in jiu-jitsu and that is the whole dynamic between technique and strength and whether or not uh you're whether or not it's 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 i guess valid for jiu-jitsu people to be pursuing strength and weightlifting and you know all that kind of stuff and it, 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 the, the idea of technique over strength i think has had kind of a dual impact on me personally i'll speak from my personal experience i, I think it's hindered me it's helped me in a way where I understand that technique and understanding the art of jujitsu is very important and, and to not rely on just physical attributes. You should understand how the, the points of leverage and balance and timing and things like that. That's all the essence of jujitsu for sure. I think it's hindered me though at the same time that when you're doing anything physical, being strong helps. <laughs> it helps a lot. It also yeah. keeps you from getting, it keeps your joints protected from being from being injured. It, it keeps you mobile. It keeps you limber. Um, and jujitsu can do that for you as well. If you train just jujitsu, it can do that to a degree. But man, there's a point where if you're if you're a guy that lifts weights and who does focused functional training and mobility drills and yoga, these things are only going to make all that easier. Um, and we're, we're having this conversation at kind of an interesting time because I just uh, three weeks ago got back on a lifting routine for the first time in a couple of years, and I can't tell you how much better I feel. Like I feel so much better. And I think the one thing that I struggle with the most in jujitsu is that when I get tired. I see everything that I know to do. Like, okay, I should be grabbing this. I should be, okay, there's space there. I should be capitalizing on that, but I'm just too damn tired to do it. So it's like, I'm, it's like, I'm, it's like I'm watching these opportunities. It's like I'm sitting in a river and I'm watching these beautiful boats float by that I want to grab onto and I just can't. So is, so is that something that you run into a lot in jujitsu? Do you run into a lot of resistance from people that are kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to spend my day lifting weights when I could be on the mats? Uh, yes and no. The people who ultimately train with us understand that it's important to do it. So we don't see too much pushback, um, internally, obviously, cause they're paying money to be there. And, um, you know, they understand the benefits of strength training for jujitsu or for anything physical, like you said. Um, but it is something that we deal with globally speaking, 
like you said, the um, the prevailing uh, mindset in jujitsu overall is that while technique is the most important thing and strength, if, if you have any um, any move toward getting stronger is in a sense like barbaric and yeah. and jujitsu should be you know beautiful and fluid and all that stuff. Listen, nobody ever got hurt by being too strong, yeah. and and like we said earlier, it's something that you can do and you have to do you know a hundred percent if you want anything to, to happen, you, you kind of have to go hard. And so having that strength and conditioning, um, foundation, it becomes really, really important, especially as you do this later and later, um, in your life. You know, I think obviously technique plays a huge role in winners and losers, right? Like who wins and who loses. If the technique is better, strength maybe doesn't have as big a, or doesn't play as big a role. Sure. However, you know, when all things are equal, if two people with the same technique are going at it, the stronger one usually wins, you know, strength and mobility and, and your conditioning amplify technique. So it's not a, it's, you know, conditioning these things or building strength doesn't take away from the technique. It, if anything, it enhances it. And that's something that we try to preach as much as we can, because if you are stronger, you can hold the position longer. If you can hold the position longer, you have more time to think about what you're going to do next. And there's other things, you know, there are, uh, there are other implications that come with being um, the stronger, more mobile athlete. Absolutely. Well, you know, so, so, something else that I notice when I'm, when I'm lifting weights or when I'm in good physical shape and, and condition and paying attention to my conditioning is the idea of energy expenditure, you know, like, like for example, if I'm not lifting weights, if, I, if I'm just doing jujitsu regularly and I'm not really doing much else to improve my strength and conditioning or my cardio outside of that, I, I notice that my budget of energy that I can expend is, 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 is much lower than it would be if I was lifting. And like, I, I'll give you a classic example. Like if I'm passing guard and I'm trying to open someone's closed guard, the effort that I would usually need to open someone's feet, to open their closed guard is greater than when I'm lifting. If I'm lifting, it's like, man, that that was just. It's not. It's not yeah. that I was. It's not that I was more powerfully opening opening guard. It's just that when I reached that amount needed to open the ankles, which is the same. It's the same pounds per pressure. I didn't have to spend as much as my of my energy budget as I would have if I was not lifting. Right. So so there's just 100%. little things like that too. You know. Absolutely. Yeah something else that you specialize in that I wanted to make sure that we focus on. Uh, what is functional range conditioning for people that aren't familiar with it? So functional range conditioning is a, um, it's a, I guess I could, you could call it like a certifying body, um, uh, a company, so to speak that, uh, specializes in building mobility, uh, mobility being strength through full range of motion. Um, a lot of the coaches, a lot of the instructors it, with functional range conditioning are jujitsu black belts, which is really helpful. So they're, they're, these are people who see the benefits of, um, of building strong joints. Um, so that's really, that's the gist of it is mobility is, um, is the main focus building strength at the end ranges, right? In jujitsu, we spend so much time at end ranges, right? The goal is to break joints is to take the elbow all the way to the end and then a little bit further. And so in no other sport is that the case more or less, you know, other, other grappling sports maybe, but, um, it's really unique to jujitsu or grappling in general that we try to take people to the end range. And if you're not prepared, if your body isn't prepared to absorb the force that's applied to it, that's when it breaks, right? So it, this, this is the, this is true for any tissue, human tissue, piece of paper, cardboard, whatever. If the force applied to that tissue exceeds that tissue's ability to absorb or, or create that same force, it will break, right? That's why bones break because the, the force applied to the bone was greater than the bones ability to absorb. And therefore the bone breaks joints, same way, muscles, same way. Um, so the whole idea behind the functional range conditioning lens is to number one, increase overall mobility and number two, increase the strength and control at those end ranges so that when you didn't choose to be there, it's not the first time, right? And your body's more prepared for the force that's being applied to it. That's excellent. That's really great, man. So let me ask you this then. How, what, what's the best method, uh, in your opinion, for jujitsu guys who've never done this before to start building some of that mobility? What, what are some exercises that you think are, uh, are really good to start with? 
Yeah. So, um, cars is really the, like the foundational piece behind, uh, behind all the stuff that FRC does. Uh, car stands for controlled articular rotations. And the three key tenants there are, you never move through what's called closing angle pain. So closing angle just means if I, if I tilt my head this way and, uh, like this angle's closing, this angle's opening. If I feel pain on the closing angle side, that just means my joint is typically like the bone is coming together and we don't want to move through that because if you do have closing angle pain and you move through it, it will probably feel worse tomorrow. And so if you ever feel closing angle pain, we want to move around that and we want to move as much as we can through uh, pain free ranges as possible. Um, the next thing is we can only move the joint that we're working on. So if I'm, you know, doing my neck cars and I start to move my, my torso, now that's my spine acting as my neck. It's impossible for me to get a good read as to what my neck is actually capable of. And then finally, uh, we have to move through full range of motion in order for any mobility training to work. Right. So for instance, if I like I'm doing my shoulder and I just do a circle like this, that's not going to improve my mobility in my shoulder because I haven't pushed the joint to its limit. Mm. Similarly, if I pick up a five pound dumbbell, I lift it five times. My biceps not going to get any bigger because I haven't pushed the muscle tissue to its end capacity. Mm. Same thing with joints. I have to move it all the way through the end range of motion. Otherwise my brain doesn't know to send the, the requisite fluid and nutrients to the joint that are going to allow it to open up space in the capsule. So I would say if any, if people are going to start anywhere, that's the place to start. And we have, um, so we have several resources, but the most pertinent one is probably the, uh, BJJ competitors warm up, um, which you can find that the, the link in our bio, I, I can tell everybody where to go at the end, but, um, that's the, that is the main focus of it is just getting the joints lubricated and ready for higher levels of work while building foundational mobility. Outstanding. Let's talk about that a little bit, because obviously priming your body for, for a hard training session or for competition is something really important. And you see people doing all different kinds of things. There doesn't seem to be like one uh, kind of collective uh, thing that we all agree on that are the best ways to warm up. What, what do you think is the best warm up for like if, if you're going to compete at a tournament, which I know you do often, what, what do you like to do? Yeah. So um, I think from a global standpoint, the biggest thing is just building a routine. And so that starts with showing up the you know right amount of time before your match is supposed to go and i understand like there are some variables that we don't have control over sometimes they run early sometimes they run late uh, but being kind of in that general time frame is really helpful um, the second is if you can do everything the same right i my routine personally i get there an hour and a half early i go in the stands and i sit there and i read for like a half hour just kind of like bring myself down because it's loud. It's hot. There's a lot of things going on. I want to just get my mind off of those things. Once I'm about an hour, 50 minutes to an hour, I'll like put on my gi, take my fingers. And then I head down to the bullpen, wait for my name to pop up. Once my name pops up, I check in. And then when I'm in the bullpen, I do my dynamic warm up. And so for the dynamic warm up, I start with full body cars. I go neck all the way down my toes. And then, um, the dynamic part of this is, uh, meant to get my heart rate up, um, increase my core temperature, uh, prime, you know, certain muscles and parts for, um, the work that's going to come. Right. Um, and then finally to what we call potentiate, which just means, um, well, we want to do something that's intense so that we're ready to go. Right. Because the match is intense. Uh, you don't want to like be doing this like slow yoga routine where you're breathing really, you know, you would need some kind of, um, you need something that's going to mimic what it is you're going to do. And so that's where like your pogos and jumping jacks and things like that skips will all come into play because they're getting you ready to kind of, to bounce or be explosive. Right. Um, so that's how we structure it. It's excellent. I really like that a lot, man. Yeah, I, th I think it's nice. Like you said, it's nice to have a ritual that so that you don't even have to think about it. Uh, you show up, you do your thing, and you you know what each step is. I think having having a planned out regimen like that helps you keep calm. It helps you keep uh, your, your body also kind of, kind of teaches your body to be ready 
for what's next. You know, I think your body kind of understands, okay, hey, we're going through this pattern. We know this pattern. This is a this is something we've been through before. We're about to go out there and, and perform. So that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's really cool, man. I also, I also really I, like the fact that you get there an hour early and, and you kind of adjust yourself to the ambience of, of, of the building. That, that's something you don't hear people talk about a lot. You know, to your point earlier, um, the amount of energy you have to spend on all those other things greatly diminishes when you develop a routine that's the same every time. Um, you know, it's something that I didn't do when I first started, uh, you know, when I first started competing at white and blue, I would show up, I didn't know what was going on and it's, nobody really tells you, right. They're just like, show up, show up at a certain time. And then there's a bullpen go. And you're like, Oh, okay. And I wish, you know, in hockey, we had a ritual, right? You show up at the same time, you put on your gear the same way you go out, you warm up the same way you've got the same drills, you know, it's all, it's all built in for you. Nobody really told me that in jujitsu. And so I kind of had to build that myself. Now that I'm doing it like this, I'm like, wow, I I mean, it was kind of right in front of me the whole time. I learned it my whole life. And, you know, now only now am I applying it. Um, But I do think that the amount of energy you have to spend on all the other things gets so much easier to manage when you have a routine. Um, so that's something that I think is super important. Um, aside from the dynamic warm up part of things, is just the routine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it hits home for me too because I, I can think back to like when I competed younger, like when I was like a blue belt or a white belt, and I, w- I would just mimic things I've seen. So like one minute I'm, I'm doing like Hicks and Gracie's beach movements that he does, like the yoga kind of stuff, and the next second I'm yeah. doing like some some shadow boxing thing I saw in the Ultimate Fighter. Like I saw someone like doing like a, <laughs> like, a, like a shadow box with sprawls, and I'm just like, there's no rhyme or reason to any of this. I guess I'm I guess I'm warming up, but I don't know if I'm doing it right. So I think yeah. it's, I think it's cool that yeah that you, people like you are out there now really laying this out and making it comprehensive. So I appreciate all your work, man. Um, you know, we talked we talked about how you know when you do strength and conditioning and you do these mobility training uh, these mobility exercises that obviously can help tremendously with injury prevention. What, what do you like to do with people who are post injury? Like if someone who's someone who's injured or coming back from an injury and kind of easing their way back in, what are some ways that mobility training uh, can help them ease back in uh, more well, efficiently? Good rehab is just good training. That's a Mike Boyle line. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the strength and conditioning scene, but Mike Boyle is a Boston guy yeah. and uh, he's OG strength coach. I mean, he's like widely considered one of the greatest of all time. And that's something that he's really drilled um, into my head was that just good rehab is just good training in that you find out where they're at, what can they do? train them to do the thing they can do, and then just slowly push the envelope. I think where a lot of people run into problems is they try to jump back into something too intense too quickly. And that's where people get re-injured or are unable to get out of the cycle of, of pain that they might be in um, or injury that they might be, you know, be experiencing. And so I think the key ultimately is just to find out what you're capable of without pain and then do that and then keep doing that until that's easy and then do a little bit more and you just keep going from there. That's excellent. I really like that a lot, man. Yeah. Cause I think that obviously this kind of training is obviously beneficial for whether you're, whether you're hurt or not, but I could see where as a, as a, from a therapeutic perspective, I could see it being a really good way to, to prime your body to be returning to training after someone's been out with injury. So uh, mm-hmm. that's really awesome. Man. I, I, I love that you lay all this out so well, man. Um, Matt, I'll tell you what, we've reached about the halfway point of the show, man. This is where I always play a game with my guest. Uh, this is a game okay. called the game's called the pummel. The pummel is basically, it's a series of random questions. Some of these have to mm-hmm. do with jujitsu. Jiu-jitsu. Some of them have nothing to do with jujitsu. Uh, but if you're down to play the pummel, I'd love to play this game with you. Hit me. All right, man. Question one. What's the worst job you've ever had in your life? I worked for Subway <laughs> oh, for, two right. <laughs> for two yeah. weeks. For two weeks. Yeah, yeah. I worked for Subway. <laughs> it was not, not my cup of tea. I think I was 15 or 16 years old and... It didn't last last very long at all, dude. That's amazing. I think you you barely beat my brothers. My brother worked for Subway for like three weeks, so you barely you, okay. barely, you, barely, you barely beat him with the tolerance for Subway. I feel you. Man. All right, oh, I, I feel man. that. What about uh, secret talent that you have? Uh, secret talent. I don't know how much of a secret it is. I guess I just don't talk about it all that much. I'm really good with languages. Cool. Um, nice. Languages come really well to me. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier I was going to teach French at a private school. Yeah, yeah. Like I started teaching myself French in college. And I've gotten to the point where I can walk around and people, native speakers don't question where I'm from, which is the greatest compliment I could ever get. That's really good. Um, And so my, 
I, uh, I spent a lot of time in French Canada and I'll go to Quebec city and Montreal a lot. And, um, those are places that I hold near and dear to my heart. And, um, so when I go there, I don't speak a lick of English and nobody asks where I'm from, which is great. So that's that I would amazing. say if I had a special, uh, a special talent, then that's, that's probably it. That's amazing, man. So, so you speak English and French fluently. Do you speak any, any other it, languages besides those? English and French fluently. I understand now a fair amount of Portuguese. Nice. Cool. I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to speak it, but I, I get what people are saying and I can, I can pick up, you know, more or less, especially at tournaments. That's really easy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like, you know, my coaches are, are, are from Brazil. And so they all pretty much all speak Portuguese all the time outside of coaching me. And so, uh, I've started to pick that up. Uh, my wife is Greek and so she, she speaks Greek and, nice. um, so I'm starting to pick that up too. I, I, again, wouldn't consider myself fluent in either of those, but I understand them at least, uh, to a certain degree. And I know that when I do finally like put my nose to the grindstone and start to start to study them that, that they'll come quickly that's awesome man yeah lear learning languages is fun man i uh i used to be fluent in spanish i'm now practically i'm pretty fluent in portuguese now but portuguese destroyed my spanish so, like now i can't speak spanish anymore so when, so when yeah. i see so when i see people when i say <laughs> at least when i try to speak spanish portuguese just gets thrown in there no one understands so so uh it, i'm always impressed by people that can pick up multiple languages it's like man that's that's really a, a mental balance and it's it's impressive when people can do it so thank you yeah let me ask you this what do you think is something you wish uh, outside of martial arts something you wish you were better at <sighs> something i wish i was better i don't know i'm pretty good at most of the things i do uh, <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um i'll say uh well i'm sitting in our piano room right now the piano i haven't played in a long time so i wish i was better at the piano nice that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Yeah, definitely a good answer for sure. What, what do you think? My my wife uh, my wife is a music teacher, so she'll uh, she's probably outside laughing at what I just said right that's now. Awesome. She's like, you have you have the way to get better is just by practicing. So I'm, sitting, I'm <laughs> sitting right here. You can learn for free. That's awesome. Right, right. That's super cool. Uh, what do you think is the worst injury you've ever had? <sighs> worst injury I've ever had. Uh, okay, I'll say acutely the worst injury i've ever had i broke my jaw oh man uh i broke my i had stage four trauma in my teeth and my jaw I had my teeth kind of snapped back in my head Ugh. if anybody's squeamish now is probably the time you can skip over this part <laughs> uh i took a puck to the mouth actually i i was uh i was playing i was probably 19 20 years old and um one of my teammates shot a puck in a different direction but it went off of somebody's stick and into my mouth and i watched the whole thing I knew as soon as it came at me, I was like, that's going to hurt. And it hit <laughs> and it snapped my teeth, my jaw, my nose. It cut my, uh, it cut my lips so wide open. I could close my mouth and see my teeth. It was really gross. Um, but I would say that's probably the worst one that I've had. Yeah. I, 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 I was, when you said that, when you mentioned your teeth and your jaw, I could only assume it came from <laughs> hockey. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's, there's nothing worse than that too. When you see something inevitably coming in your way and all you can't move the timings off and you just know, man, this yeah. is, this is going to suck. Like this is, yep. this is about to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, man, I'm, I'm glad it hasn't, it wasn't anything too, too traumatic, man. What do you think is uh, your favorite bad food to eat? Mm, I'll start by saying, I don't think any food is bad. Um, but I definitely have, uh, I mean, I love ice cream. Nice. I'm an ice, I'm an ice cream fiend. Uh, nice. Ben and Jerry's is my soul or, uh, <laughs> is my primary supplier. <laughs> That's awesome. Really nice. Uh, what do you think yeah. was the scariest moment of your life? Scariest moment of my life. Um, man. Um, I haven't had any knock on wood near death experiences. That's good. That's good. Uh, you could probably, I mean, resetting my jaw sucked. Yeah. That was really not fun, yeah. but I would say maybe on a, um, on a different level, like leaving everything I knew on the East coast behind to come out here to California and do something I, you know, I'd never done before was probably pretty, I was a little scared. Um, starting my own business was scary. Uh, you know, uh, there's been plenty of, I guess, quote, scary things, nothing, but nothing that really like chilled me to the bone. Yeah. 
Well, that, that's a great answer, dude. No, like obviously, like leaving, leaving, leaving your your uh, where you grew up and starting all over somewhere else. That's 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 a that's a tough one, man, for sure. So, I appreciate yeah. appreciate you sharing that. Um, what is your most hated position in jujitsu to get stuck in? <sighs> hated position. Mm. <sighs> to get stuck in. Has my guard already been passed or is yeah. it? <laughs> let's say your guard, yeah, let's say your guard's it, been passed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Guard's been passed. Um, I mean, it's got to be, it's got to be the, it's got to be the mount. Yeah. I, I hate, I hate the mount, especially somebody who's good at, <laughs> who's good at holding the mount. Yeah. It's, it's miserable. Yeah. Like at least if they have your back, not to say you have an excuse, but it's like, you can't see them so <laughs> so so it's like if they do get you i couldn't see you but if it's in mount you see it coming and you still can't do anything about it it's it's strangely worse that's the than, worst. Than, than the back yeah that's the worst dude there's this old guy there's this older guy i train with and he's like an og black belt and uh if he gets if you let him get to mount like dude he, the way he sinks his hip Forget pressure it. down it's, it's like your bowels are going to come out from your cheeks it's it's horrible yeah. it's just it's it's the worst pressure and there's just not much you can do about it you can just sit there and just I, watch you know i should give you a, an honorable mention is so my, my coach in the morning vitor pasquale is uh is a black belt obviously and he he uh he calls it mcdonald's pressure <laughs> and it's from the it's from it's from the it's from the kezagatami position and he has this way of just putting the right amount of pressure. He's he's inhaling and expanding his ribs, and so with every time with every time you exhale, he inhales, and it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And then when it's when you think it can't get worse, he he somehow I don't know how he does it. He pulls his pressure off, and it feels like you get stabbed right in the ribs. Oh. And that I would say it's it's like it's like this weird release. <laughs> Yeah. And it's painful and it's like, thank goodness he's gone, but also, ow, that really hurts. <laughs> and it lasts maybe a couple seconds. You're just like, oh, just totally debilitated. And by the time you, by the time you're past that, he's already into the next thing and, oh. and you're done. So, Dude, it's, so. <laughs> there, are some, there are some people out there that just find these positions that are just the most suffering, the most like, and yeah. uh, the most agonizing things. I have an old friend of mine, uh, Tyler Driscoll from my, from my team back home and uh, at uh, Creighton MMA, he, uh, he has this thing called the big brother. And it's basically a cross between case of Katami and a cradle so it's kind of like he's got your leg yeah. hooked plus the case of Katami and it's it's like you described like every every little bit of air that you let out it's not going to come back in so you're yep. kind of in this battle of trying to breathe but not breathing too much so you don't let all your ex oxygen out it, uh, it's, yep. oh, it's the worst man who, who do you think is your favorite grappler of all time Ooh, man that's tough um obviously Kyle's played a huge role in my development I'd be hard pressed to not mention him um my favorite people to watch for my own game obviously like body types are different and um uh, body types are different styles are different and so you know i don't play the same game that that kyo did or does um i love watching tainan dalpra he's my favorite right now to watch i try to emulate him as best i can um, we've got similar dimensions where, you know, similar size, similar levels of athleticism. I feel like I, um, he's somebody that I watch really, really closely. When I was a blue belt, it was the Meow Brothers. So this past weekend, I was at, I was at American Nationals. I got a chance to watch Joao and, and seeing him do his thing. was like, man, like I spent my whole two years at blue belt on upside down because of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, there are, there are a few, but I would say um, Tainan is one that I really, really pay close attention to now. He's my favorite one to watch now. Uh, the Mendez brothers, the Meow brothers, um, those are all, those have played huge roles. Excellent choices, man. By the way, I meant to mention in your introduction, man, congr congratulations on the bronze medal at the American Nationals, man. You had Thank you. Excellent yeah. work. I meant to mention that before. Nice. Sorry about that. Uh, I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think is your biggest phobia? Biggest phobia? I don't know if I have one. I, I don't, I hate that. I'm not trying to sound hard or anything. I just, I feel like I feel pretty Zen about it all. If, if whatever is going to happen is going to happen. I try not to pay too much attention to things I can't control. Um, you know, uh, 
I don't find myself afraid of insects or spiders or snakes or anything. I mean, maybe I would, maybe I would say that differently if there was one right here in my room, I don't know, but (laughs) you know, I like, I, I grew up in the woods in Virginia. And so, um, I feel like I'm pretty used to all that stuff. I, I try not to, like I said, I try to take myself too, too seriously, even in competition. I, it's all just data to me. I don't, look at it as like, uh, you know, my goodness, like, what if I lose, you know, I, I used to, when I was white and blue, I I came from, like I said, I came from hockey. So the whole thing was, you know, you gotta win, you gotta win, you gotta win. And I, I wish I had learned what I learned now then when I was playing and coaching even, and that it's all just data points. And so I try, like I said, I try not to like put too much pressure on myself and just go out there and do everything I can. And if it doesn't work, I just go back and do it again. And and try you know try something different and if that doesn't work then i come back and i do it again and so i don't think i'm afraid of losing um i'm not af- I, I don't know i don't think i have one off the top of my head that's good no there's a great answer though man I, I love that it took that detour into the whole idea of uh, collecting data because that's something that i think is very valuable for people to hear for sure yeah, you can't win them all but you can certainly learn from them all so that's excellent yeah uh who do you think is your favorite superhero favorite superhero um it's probably spider-man Spider-Man, good choice. Yeah, yeah. I could, feel like if if any if any superhero did jujitsu, he'd be the best one at it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> him, 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 or, him, or him, or or Mister Fantastic with the, with the long, yeah. stretchy. Uh, yeah, limbs yeah, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be something like that. So someone real agile and 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 yeah, uh, yeah, those attributes for sure. If you could have a superpower, what would you choose? <sighs> if I had a superpower, what would I choose? Um, I guess staying true to the language theme, being able to speak any language, I think would be a cool, cool superpower being, being able to speak any language fluently fit in with, you know, whoever you kind of blend in, in, in a lot of places. Um, I think that'd be kind of cool. Um, that's probably maybe, I guess, not that learning every language is realistic, but m- the most realistic that I could come up with. But I guess if I had one that doesn't exist, I think invisibility would be good. That'd be a good one. Yeah. It'd be hard for people to defend a triangle choke if uh, <laughs> if I was invisible. And you're like, you have no idea where I'm at right now. <laughs> it's like, where is he? I can't see his grips. What's going on? Right, yeah, right, right. That's awesome. And final question for the pummel game, Matt. Uh, if a zombie apocalypse breaks out right now, what's the first thing you do? <sighs> move to Denver. Uh, move to the mountains. Go, go uh, inland and up. Nice. So I, <laughs> take the strategic advantage of fighting downward, right? <laughs> Excellent uh, answer, man. <laughs> that, that was the final question for the pummel game. Congratulations, you win. You got your double under. Thanks, man. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> so, man, let me ask you this. When it comes to uh, strength and conditioning, how do you like to balance out calisthenics and weight training? Because I know those are two things that are very important for different things. Uh, for jujitsu athletes, though, wh- wh- where's that balance lie between calisthenics and weights? Well... Our whole goal is to build as complete an athletic profile as possible. So every training session with us features all of it. Uh, we feature, you know, there's mobility, um, tissue quality, there's movement quality. We go through, you know, different movement patterns that are just meant to build, build better athletes. You know, whether that's skips or karaoke's or, um, you know, running backwards or, you know, there's any number of movements that we can throw at people, bear crawls, crab walks, um, all kinds of different things just to develop that athleticism. That's really, really important. We move from there into speed and power work because now we're warm and we don't want to do power stuff at the end when we're tired. We want to do it when we're fresh so that we can um, exert the maximum amount of force in the short and shortest amount of time. Um, and then we move from there into our strength stuff. So I'd be lying if I said one was more important than the other, they're, they're all important. And so it's for us, we want to train them concurrently because if you're not training something, you're effectively detraining it. And if you're detraining it, then you're getting worse at it. And so um, all of our sessions feature all the different qualities so that we get the, the best athletic profile we can out of each of our athletes. That's outstanding. Man. I really like that. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that you see from jujitsu athletes who come to you regarding like what they think they need in a strength training session? Uh, 
the biggest misconception is that it has to hurt to be good and that it must be very difficult to have any effect. It does not have to be backbreakingly hard to have the proper effect. We're after very specific physiological adaptations. And a lot of times that takes doing less than you think, um, you know, with regards to like power stuff, we, we like power is just force with a time component. So how fast can you produce a certain amount of force? And so when we train power, we, we program or we schedule fewer reps, right? And it's meant that it's that way on a, on purpose. It's because if you're doing high rep medicine ball throws, eventually that power work becomes just conditioning. And that's not what we're after, right? We're after fast. We're after very, very quick, sharp movements. And so we'll program maybe five to 10 reps of something. I think a lot of people think, well, if five, if five reps is good, then 10 reps is better. And if 10 reps is good, then 20 reps is better. And they'll just do as many as they can. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Hold on. Bring it back. Uh, you know, we, we program it that way on purpose. And just because, you know, they weren't the 10 perfect reps or whatever, doesn't mean you need to do 10 more, just do 10. Let's get better at the next 10 and we'll get better at the next 10. We just keep going there. But so I think that's probably the biggest misconception is that it has to be tiring and it has to be very difficult for it to work. That's awesome. Yeah, that, I, I'm glad you said that because I think that's something that I can see being a, a common misconception is that yeah, if you're not if you're not like leaving the place, you know, crawling, then then, you, then what work did you really put in? So right, that makes perfect sense. Are are you much of a believer of going of doing exercises until failure? Because uh, I know that there's there's some people that that have different um, opinions on that of whether or not you should be setting a particular goal for reps on on a particular exercise or if you should go t until failure. What are your thoughts on that? So for any strength training to take and to take effect, it, you have to work within one to three reps of failure, more or less. Okay. Uh, that's kind of our goal for all of our rep ranges. Um, as far as to failure, we go maybe once a month to failure and everything else is just building up to that. So for instance, if we're in a strength block, say week one is our deload week. And that's like when we take some time, it's fewer sets, maybe a few more reps, lighter weight, lighter intensity so that we get used to the movement. It's new. We want to make sure we dial in the form in the first week. Then second week, we go down in reps a little bit and up in intensity. So up in weight, if, if we're, we'll talk about like a deadlift, for example. So maybe first week is two by 10, two sets, 10 reps. Okay. Maybe seven out of 10 is what we're looking for. 70% ish of your max. And then week two, we go three sets of eight reps. So maybe a little more volume, um, but less reps and more intensity. And then week three, we go three by six. So even less reps, more intensity. And then the last week we go three by four. And so that's even fewer reps and the highest intensity. And we say, you know, we tell people if week one is like a seven out of 10, week two should be about an eight out of 10. Week three should be about a nine out of 10. And then week four, that's our send it week. Just go all out. Everything you got on the table, put it out there, do everything you can. You should have no reps left in the tank. Um, and then what we do is the next week, we go back to our deload and we rest and relax and go back down a little bit. The, the idea though, is that in that second deload week, it's maybe a little bit higher than the first deload week. So if we did 185 pounds, on that first deload week, maybe we do 190 on the, on the next one. And then each time it goes up just a little bit. Right. And then on the third deload week, maybe it's 200 and we just keep inching up that way. So that's kind of how we approach it. So I'm not going to say, I don't believe in, um, in training to failure. I just think it has to be done in a controlled setting and, and every once in a while, because if you're doing it all the time, you burn out. And if you do it, never, you don't actually stimulate the muscle as much as you probably could or should. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense, man. Let me ask you this. Generally speaking, are the regimens that you design for people, are they going to be much more intense for a competitive athlete than it would be for just an everyday practitioner that's looking to get more mobility and strength? Or do they look pretty similar? They look pretty similar. Yeah. Um, you know, I think at the beginning of my career, I thought, well, everybody needs the exact different or, it's not, you know, everybody needs a completely new, different program. In reality, that's not the case, you know, like, uh, we have a template 
and everybody follows the same general skeleton. But we mix and match depending on what people, because everybody presents with somebody something different, right? Somebody comes in, they hurt their shoulder. Another person comes in, they hurt their knee. So the programs might look almost identical, but within those exercises, we might say, okay, like shoulder. So he's probably not going to bench press, but we can do a single arm press on one side and maybe take it light on the other side. Okay. So there's where the, um, there's where the differences come in. Um, but for an athlete or a competitor, somebody who's like, um, you know, doing it full time, not much difference, not, not as much difference as people might think. Interesting. That's, that's really cool to hear, man. Yeah, that's really cool. Let me ask you this for people that come to you to improve their mobility, uh, and people that follow your, your teachings, uh, remotely for, for, for mobility. What do you think are the most effective ways for them to track their progress, uh, within their, within their own body's mobility? Yeah, as far as mobility goes, taking video is really, really helpful. Um, so taking video of yourself from the front, from the side, from the back, mm. um, that's all extremely useful. Um, you know, when I first learned from like the FRC guys, I was at the UFCPI for that. And that was awesome. Just getting to be in that, um, in that setting was, was really, really cool. Uh, but they mentioned, you know, like take video of yourself doing cars today and take video of yourself six months from now and see how that's changed. And it's amazing the difference, um, you know, not only in range of motion, but just movement quality, my control over one limb versus the other, um, or I should say, you know, being able to control one limb at a time, um, without compensating elsewhere has changed a lot. Um, so I would say for people doing it at home, video is a great way to, to measure yourself. Um, you know, and you can take those from several different angles and there are so many different ways to move your body. Um, the, the, the possibilities are pretty limitless there. Yeah, that's great advice, man. Yeah, I think being able to being able to review review your own movements uh, through video is obviously a great way to track that. So I appreciate that recommendation. Uh, you know, speaking of people, uh, speaking of learning remotely from you, Matt, you have a, a really cool ebook that you just made with us. And a lot of people listening might not be aware that we have a lot of ebooks here at BJJ Fanatics, also not just videos. Uh, this is called uh, "Move, Feel, and Perform Better" uh, by Matt. So, Matt, tell us about this ebook, man. What 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 do you think people can expect to take from it? And what were some of the main points you were trying to drive home when you were designing it yeah so um i guess one of the things that we wanted to do was make it uh so that we didn't uh people following the ebook don't have to take time away from the things they love to do whether that's playing with their kids or jujitsu or whatever it is nice um that's uh, that's one of the other things that people come to us they're like well i gotta train five days a week if i want to see any progress well no, you don't. You, you just have to train effectively and efficiently. And so we built it so that we can get all of the um, necessary or requisite movement patterns in in as short a period of time as possible. So it's only two days a week, which means the time commitment is really low. It takes probably two to three hours a week to complete the, you know, the whole program, um, which means you're able to do more of the things you love. And that's kind of the idea is that we want to you know, minimum effective dose. How little can I do getting the maximum uh, return on my investment, right? Um, so I think that's something that might surprise people is that it's not a really long program. It's 12 weeks long, but it's not a lot from a week to week time commitment standpoint. It's not that much. Um, but like we talked about before, it's it follows a natural progression. Um, each movement builds on the last one. So you're not learning a whole new thing from month to month. You're taking, you know, if it's a dumbbell bench press, maybe you're doing a dumbbell bench press one week. And then, you know, in the next program, it's a single arm dumbbell bench press. So there's not a lot of very, it's variation without change, I should say, right? We're changing things up just a little bit, just enough to get a little bit different stimulus, but not enough that you have to completely relearn something new every four weeks, if that makes sense. That's excellent, man. And do, do you find that most people that, that, that commit to this kind of program can train jujitsu in the same day usually? Because I know you mentioned that uh, a lot of people have a hard time balancing in their mind, like, oh, if I do this, then I can't do this. Is it usually, uh, yeah? 100%, yeah. I mean, most of the people who train with us train twice a week um, and then train jujitsu five, six, seven times a week. Um, so people following the ebook, you can totally, um, you can totally do um, you know, a workout and train jujitsu uh, in the same day. In fact, we recommend it. We want to, it's what's called consolidating stressors. So, 
if we've got a hard day um, on the mats, it's as much as it might suck to do it in the moment, it's helpful to actually work out that day so that you get more days of rest, like pure rest, right? Um, because that's really, really important. You're only as good as um, your recovery. If you can't recover, then you can't adapt. And if you can't adapt, then you're bound to you know, burn out. So um, that's a huge component there is the recovery aspect is, we, you know, we, we plan our sessions and our workouts the way we do so that people can recover as much as possible in between sessions. And that's where the results come. That's outstanding. I love that. Well, guys, yeah, like I said, we have ebooks at bjjfanatics.com. So you guys head over, uh, pick up Matt's book. It's called Move, Feel, Perform Better. And it's available right now uh, on the website, bjjfanatics.com. Uh, Matt, in closing, man, what are some of your major goals for 2023? You've obviously got a great facility going out in San Jose. Uh, you're competing well uh, at, at, the, at the national and international level. What are some things you hope to accomplish by the end of the year? Um, well, from a business standpoint, um, our goal is to get to 75 members. Um, so that's, we're hovering ar around 50 right now. So we've got a little bit of work to do, but, um, you know, things are looking up. People are starting to know about us, which is great. We're getting out there where, um, you know, the word is getting past my own home gym at Kyos, um, to other gyms in the Bay area. And that's been, um, super helpful. So from a business perspective, we'd like to get to 75 members on the year personally, um, Actually, this was uh, this was one of my goals. I had it written on my uh, my dream goals, you know, uh, list for the for the year. I was like, I'm going to get on BJJ Fanatics podcast. Oh, that means uh, thank you, man. And, and so, um, so having you know accomplished this, that, that definitely checks one of those boxes. Um, but I'd like to. I mean, I set out for myself. I said I wanted to compete ten times in 2023. I did that in six months. So now I guess the goal is 20. Uh, so we, <laughs> we yeah, I got a. I got a few, I got a few more to do. Um, I'm signed up for San Diego open and then, uh, sign up for masters worlds and in, in Vegas at the end of August. And then after that, I'll probably do just, you know, some smaller ones, um, you know, local ones, uh, through, throughout the end of the year. But, um, yeah, I just, I want to compete more. I want to train more and, uh, just keep doing the, keep doing the things I love. That's all. That's awesome. Well, I, I, that means a lot that the, 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 the getting on the podcast was on your was on your dream board, man. I mean, that really does mean a lot. Thank you for that. <laughs> you're the man. You're, so, you're, you're a great interviewer. Good, uh, good work. It's, it, it shows that you've done this 500 sometimes. <laughs> thank so. you, brother. That really means a lot. I really do appreciate that. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. Matt, I've really enjoyed this conversation a lot, man. I appreciate you uh, doing such a great job of, of shedding light on strength and conditioning and the ways that it can help uh, jujitsu practitioners and athletes. And I also appreciate all the info you gave on mobility, because I think that's something that's obviously hand in hand with uh, strength and training and jujitsu and longevity. Uh, so your, your time here was really appreciated today, man. You're welcome back anytime you'd like to come on. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And for anyone out there that wants to keep up with Matt, it's real easy to do so. He's active on Facebook. He has a page, Victory High Performance, uh, but he's most active on Instagram. Uh, he has two profiles you can follow on Instagram. It's Victory High Performance. Uh, that's for his uh, for his facility in San Jose. And then he's also got his personal one, which is matt.jits.hugh. Uh, so that's a great way to keep up with all the things that he's got going on. His YouTube channel is Victory High Performance. Uh, you guys, make sure you check out that video he mentioned earlier. They just made a really good four to five minute video all about about uh, effectively warming up before competition or training. And that's available on his YouTube channel. So go check that out. Make sure you guys subscribe and hit the little bell icon to get notified when new videos get added. Uh, he's also got a website, victoryhighperformance.com. That's for his uh, his facility. If you guys are ever passing through San Jose, drop in and say hey to Matt and check it out. Uh, and if you can't make it out to San Jose for whatever reason, you can learn from Matt anywhere in the world with his ebook that he has with us here at bjjfanatics.com called Move, Feel, Perform Better. So you guys go check that out and get uh, get your game to the next level by, by improving your strength and conditioning and mobility. And that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BJJ Fanatics podcast.